Welcome back to Take Fountain. I'm here again, Tom Mount, my partner here. And, I, and this is this show today, this is my favorite. This one, when we just sit here and talk about something that you know intimately, this is my very favorite thing in life. And we started talking about Bull Durham, which is, uh, is your movie. You say, okay, it's, it's Ron Shelton's movie. It's a lot of people's movie. But you produced Bull Durham. Um, you, what I love about this this movie, there are many things I love about this movie, and we're going to pick it apart. But one of the things that that I like is that you already were in the baseball world when this came about. Is this correct? I mean, help, help me set the stage for you producing Bull Durham. 1979, I'm working at Universal. I'm running the company, more or less, head of production or president. I don't even remember in the movie division. But I'm in charge of the movies. And... Um, I'm looking for something to develop around baseball because that same year, my friend Van Schley, who is a wonderful character and one of the great baseball scouts of all time, lives in Malibu, um, and I lived in Malibu. Um, we joined with a guy named Miles Wolf, who came to us from the front office of the Braves. Miles Wolf was a unique guy. He was a writer and a good one and had written two or three books, terrific books, some fiction, some nonfiction. His father was the editor-in-chief of a newspaper in North Carolina. He'd worked for the Braves. And the idea here was that purely as a hobby, we would unite in some way, shape, or form and start buying minor league baseball teams. Let me tell you about that. Okay. At this moment in history, the majors had abandoned the minors. There, there were no farm league, uh, league there teams. There were a few left. Yeah. But they had been in great decline from the 60s yeah. and 70s up until the end of the 70s. 20-year period of decline. Yeah. It used to be that every minor league team was owned by the local jock who had uh, uh, had success with the Ford dealership in Shreveport. And he bought a minor league team and he rented and he made it a club, uh, you know, Astros club team or something. And everything was fine. Those are called player development contracts. They okay. are horrible, by yeah, the way, right. if you own a minor league team. And the reason they're horrible is the minute you develop talent, somebody who can hit or somebody who can run or throw, they get scooped up by the big guy right. that has your player development contract with you. If you are unhappy with your manager, you can't fire him or her. Right. You have to go back to them and get them to join you in this. And there are a thousand other things that make it really annoying. So we just decided, forget all this. We're going to build an independent company. We created a company, Van and I, called uh, Texas Baseball Holding. And we bought our first team in 79. That was the Texas City Stars. Have you ever been to Texas City? I have been to Texas City. You know, I'm, I know all that area of Texas City. And Galveston's right, right not far from there. And uh, well, There's good uh, news that you got to Texas City and you came back alive. <laughs> I will say. Texas, it's a refinery town, if I is, remember. It is a refinery with a little town tacked onto it. Right. Which you wouldn't think there'd be a need for a baseball team at Texas City. A wooden stadium falling apart. Yeah. A team that was in terrible shape. The guy wanted, as I remember, something on the order of $15,000 to buy the team and to absorb a little bit of debt, maybe another $5,000 or something. So we did. We bought the Texas City Stars. Then we had to figure out why they had never made money and why they were failing and why right. nobody came to the games. Right. So the first issue there was learning about the baseball business, which I knew nothing about. Right. And Van knew something because Van had been an ardent baseball fan, and Miles knew a lot about the baseball business. But Miles was in North Carolina working to gather up some other teams. So in a very short period of time, <laughs> we, we put a company together that owned – the Texas City Stars, that was the old Texas Sea League. And mm. i got to tell you, Bill, you can't even imagine how poverty-stricken that ball club was. Yeah. I mean, there was just nothing. The big event y we... Y these, these were paid players? That oh, yeah. yeah. Paid, sort of. Sort barely, of? Barely. Barely. Mm -hmm. they, they had other jobs, and they oh played, yeah, of course played they baseball. Had, they all yeah. had to sell insurance or cars or exactly. something. Exactly, sure. Right? Yeah. Put in aluminum siding, whatever they did. So... We decided we had to get the city council to let us sell beer in the stadium. Mm -hmm. This was the first smart thing we did in the baseball business. <laughs> uh, 
and we went to the city council and we appealed. I can't to them. believe they didn't sell beer. They wouldn't in, sell in beer. Texas no, City. No, no, Texas City, fine, upright Christian Texans. They're not selling beer. People I, might. I drink. don't know a Texan who doesn't like beer. I know, and myself included. Well, there you go. So, and, but you're not a Texan. I just point out mm. that. In Oklahoma, where you're from, they refer to Texas as Baja, Oklahoma. <laughs> yes, that's I, right. I go, I go either way. If this was story, it, w- it started in Oklahoma. I would be an Oklahoman. I, okay. I, I accept both. Right. But go ahead. Yeah, you're flexible. I'm flexible. And, and, mm-hmm. and in this time of, you know, yes. anyway, flexibility, flexibility is a good yes. thing. Right. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, pretty quickly, we had a company that owned the Utica Blue Sox, the Asheville <laughs> Tourists. The, <laughs> the Asheville Tourists. Yes, the Bellingham. That's a bad name. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, it's Asheville. <laughs> the Asheville Tourists. Beautiful. McCormick Field, a beautiful old wooden ballpark. Uh, falling apart again, but yeah. great. Mm-hmm. And the tourists were terrific, and that's in the Appalachian League. Yeah. And then in the Carolina League, we wanted the team, and we wanted the Durham Bulls. Miles, the Bulls hadn't existed for a few years, but the franchise was still owned by somebody. So Miles made a deal to buy the franchise. We put... $2,500 down, as I remember. Wow. And then our total cost was about $35,000. In those days, you could go around and buy a team for thirty-five grand. Oh, yes, for less. You kidding? We spent much less than that and owned the fine Texas City stuff. Oh, that's right, fifteen grand or something. Yeah, fifteen grand. I can't. I can't. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I remember in Oklahoma City, uh, any of it was a d- Anybody who grew up outside of a major market knows that there's some sort of local team, whatever. The, in Oklahoma City was the 89ers. Right. The 89ers. And I remember in the 70s going to 89ers game and having my ticket and walking around trying to figure out where my ticket was. And the guy behind me was just sit down anywhere. The, the whole place is empty. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I was go. like, that's my general take on what it was to be watch the 89ers in the 1970s. And that was the state of the minor league business. Yeah at uh, this 1979 moment. And for me, it was an enormous amount of fun. Um, I had a day job. I had to run a movie studio, and I had to get some stuff done and run around the planet and do all that stuff. So we also, by the way, I don't want to leave these out. We had the Amarillo Gold Sox. Oh, well, good, 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 yeah. Anybody's ever been to Amarillo, let me just assure you, it's a 12-day trip from Amarillo to any other civilized site (laughs) on the planet. (laughs) And I, so know, I know Amarillo well, too. So, so And our <laughs> team in Amarillo, the Gold Sox, complained mightily because they had to go play Midlands. They had to go play places. They had to go to El Paso. They had right. to go, I yeah. mean, come on. That's as the, as the stork, who was our lead left-handed pitcher, mm-hmm. used to say to me, being on this team is 12 years in a station wagon. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So it's not a glamorous world. That, no, that. no. Which, so by the way, that movie kind of captures, doesn't it? The, the lack of the, uh, you know, yes. the kind of being in the dregs of it. Anyway, go ahead. I'm so, going to stop your so story. So the good news is Miles Wolf knew what he was doing. Yeah. And that's what made the company work. And right. the next thing is Van Schley knew a lot about how to find great players. Hmm. And since we're independent, we could have an open call, auditions, if you will. Right. We'd take the ball field at Pepperdine in California and have one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast in Florida. And we just put an ad out in a few sports magazines, sporting news, and say, you want to play baseball? <laughs> Come in here and let's Come take a there, look yeah. at you. Yeah, well. And the last time we did that, before we sold the whole thing, over 3,000 people showed up in Malibu wow. to audition for our independent ball clubs. In any event, there were many others. I won't bore you with all these stuff, but let's get to Durham. Yeah. Durham had a WPA era ballpark. It actually was built before the WPA in the 20s, but it burned down. Mm -hmm. And then somebody rebuilt it in WPA money. There's some poured concrete and a lot of mold. Mm -hmm. It was falling apart. It was called El Toro Field. Mm. The Durham Bulls. Bulls, yes, the bull reference. Yes, a bull reference. Well, remember that Durham is a tobacco town in these days. Yes. Uh, The kind of tobacco town I grew up in, because I did grow up in Durham, where you would park your car downtown. When you got back, you could write your name in the windshield in the fine residue of tobacco dust that emanated from Liggett and Myers and American Tobacco and all the huge factories charming. surrounding Durham. Yeah. yeah, charming. Yeah. So you were a smoker even if you didn't want to be. Yeah, I, g- I guess. So we got El Toro Field and some deal with the city, cockeyed deal, 
at which they put no money in improvements, and we had no money, so we did very little. Right. But we began to put a ball club together. Van found great players, and Miles knew how to run the damn thing and make it work. And I f- got involved and said, well, let's see if we can do a couple of things. Let's see, first of all, if we can talk a radio station into handling the game. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, it was broadcast. Ah. Whoa. Yeah. It's something bigger than El Toro Field, yeah. which, by the way, was built in the 20s by a family, a prominent family in Durham. John Sprunt Hill had a piece of land that was deemed unusable and unbuildable because it was part of a floodplain. Uh-huh. So he <laughs> donated so it. So, yes, he so let's build a ballpark yeah, That's right. So he <laughs> donated it to the city on the theory that if they would build the ballpark, the room would have a ballpark. Right, right. Here we go. Yeah. And as we begin to get the bulls up and running, the, f- the Miles said, let's branch out a little bit. And we were very excited to do that. I got to say, Miles was our jungle guide. Mm-hmm. Van was smarter about it than I was. I was like... Uh, a babe in the woods, literally. Mm -hmm. I had no fucking clue what I was doing most of the time in this, but I knew a lot of people in media, and I knew how to talk the local CBS station, ultimately, into broadcasting the games locally Ah. on CBS, uh, affiliate CBS. sure. You know, whatever it was, uh, W dog, dog, dog. Uh And, you know. Mm -hmm. So, now enter Ron Shelton. So, you, so you, all this time you're doing this, you're the president of uh, at, uh, at Universal. Yeah, it's my hobby. This is your hobby. This you, is my you hobby. decide you want to go into the the <laughs> the Listen, b- uh, baseball I'm business, which is a terrible business. Terrible. Uh, not just uh, and not glamorous. That we're talking about farm league, not even farm league anymore. It's just uh, you're trying to create your own new network of teams. Okay, we're Car- doing that, and you we are. are creating it. We you are. By, by the time we sold the company, we had twelve teams. Yeah. Around the Bellingham Loggers, yeah. who could beat the Bellingham Loggers? Come on! That sounds so good, though. They <coughs> sound they sound good. Have you ever been to Bellingham? Yes, I have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> so, no offense, but <laughs> small town America is, shall we say, small. It's small. It's small. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Ron Shelton is a baseball player. Right. As he starts his life, he's from Santa Barbara. Terrific guy. Smart as hell. <clears throat> from the wrong side of the tracks in Santa Barbara, has a rough edge, cantankerous, really, really literate. This is, by the way, the first time I've ever heard there was a wrong side of the tracks in Santa Barbara. Well, there is. Oh, I didn't and, know that. And, and it was for fish and shrimp canning factories. Oh, okay. And there were people who worked in the factories, many of them, and there were houses, very poor houses, around those neighborhoods. Well, I'm sure it's condos <laughs> now for $5 million. Oh, no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah, All right, now, carry on. Fact, yeah. So Ron Shelton is playing for the Rochester team, which I believe is the Baltimore Orioles Farm Club in those days in the International League. Okay. It's a minor league team in Rochester. And he gets hurt, and he can't keep playing. So he makes the logical choice, become a screenwriter. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. If you are doomed in Rochester, you might as well go become a screenwriter. Yeah. So he moves to Los Angeles and starts writing, and his writing is good. Yeah. And I begin to see a screenplay or two, because I'm running a studio, and I'm looking constantly for new writers who are good. It's very hard to find, by the way, as you well know. A good screenplay yes. is a rare duck. Yep. So, Shelton is writing. And you're looking for a baseball movie. I'm looking for a baseball movie in a general sense. I have no idea how to approach right. it. Right. Okay. Ron Shelton comes in and says, let's do this. Let's t- do a story about a aging minor league player who's hanging on to baseball by his fingernails and right. doesn't want to let go, and a young whippersnapper who's got a million-dollar arm and wants to move up, and the clash these two guys have. Sounds great. That's what I said. Sounds great. Let's try it. Let's yeah. go there. Yeah. So we start developing it at Universal. In the meantime, lots of other things are happening. <laughs> Uh, Ron Shelton is not just standing still. He writes other scripts. He begins to become a second unit director on other people's movies. He's learning. He wants to be a director. He's not there yet. And ultimately, I leave Universal. And when I leave, I get to take some projects with me. One of the projects I take with me is Bull Durham. 
Ah. Because I think... I was wondering how you were the producer of the... Because you can't be a producer and no, be the president of Universal. No, you cannot, as a studio... So this is a, one of those transition projects. This I got gotcha. you. one the most meaningful transition project I had. I actually. got it. Okay, good. Because it was t entirely personal. Right. Remember, I grew up going to ball games in El Toro Field with my dad when I'm seven and eight. Right. And when the big event is um, 10 cent hot dogs, they had a 10 cent hot dog day. Yeah. Let me assure you that the idea of a 10 cent hot dog today is a yeah. little daunting. Yeah. But when you're seven or eight in Durham in the 50s, 10 cent hot dog. Absolutely. Bring it on. Yeah. So Ron goes to work. Writing a good screenplay takes a long time usually. Many times it takes more than a year. In this case, Ron did it inside a year. He wrote a few drafts. We go over those drafts in detail. I'm busy making other pictures. I'm producing. I've segued from a studio to a producer. I'm in... Harris shooting a film called Frantic with Harrison Ford, Polanski directing. Yeah, great movie. And thank you. And but that's really Roman's fault. <laughs> and and uh, my head of development, a woman named Hannah Bin Dove, who is really smart, very nice person, very smart. She says um, he's done a new draft and he's added a new core character, Annie Savoy, and she's and. She's sleeping with both guys, and I thought, perfect. Yeah. This is now, this is a movie. And Ron's draft was great. So I had tried to employ Kevin Costner on an earlier project, which was a television movie I did for, not for you guys, for CBS. You guys meaning ABC. Yeah. I'm sorry. I I'm years. trying to think, I, I, at this stage, do we know who Kevin Costner is? No. Nobody knows who Kevin Costner is, really. I yeah. mean, he'd done smaller parts and smaller roles. Yeah. But remember, his breakout film was No Way Out. Yes. Which is a remake of The Big Clock yes. for Orion. But it hadn't come out yet. hadn't been finished. So nobody knew if Kevin could carry a movie, quote unquote, or right. open a movie. Right. In any event, I wanted Kevin to play George Custer because I did this great, brilliant book about the final battle with George Custer that mm -hmm. I bought and turned into a television movie and had a pretty good script and blah, blah. And right. I wanted to use Kevin, and I had never made a television movie. It was my first foray into television. It was a nightmare. The television people expect you to do what they tell you to do. Yeah. So, well, this is, you know, I'm constitutionally ill-equipped to do what people tell me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then this whole... Mishigas about you can't use this guy because we've got this guy in a television series and we owe him a television movie. Who do I, why do I care about this? Yeah. You know, but that's the way it worked. So okay. Kevin didn't get to play Custer. I was very disappointed. We made a lackluster version of the television movie. Mm -hmm. That guy has gone on to have a big career in television. God bless him. Mm -hmm. I won't go into that. Moving on, I wanted to work with Kevin. He read this script. He thought it was great. Kevin had been a ball player in high school and right, in college. Right. You know, so he knew something about baseball. He was a pretty good ball player. And Ron, who's hanging out in the office, we all had offices in those days on the Warner Brothers lot in the Columbia Pictures Siberia. Columbia and Warner shared the same lot. Uh -huh. But Warner's had all the fancy buildings up front, the beautiful places where you drive in driveways. It looks right. like a movie studio. Yeah. In the back, there are a bunch of basically butler buildings that are bolted together and turned into offices. And that's where we were. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, Ron would take Kevin and go to the batting cage right. on Sepulveda. Right. And the batting cage on Sepulveda, they would have fun. And, and Ron's like, I love this guy. He's great. It's perfect. Let's do this. That's great. Yep. So we think that's wonderful. In the meantime, I need a financier and a distributor. So I began to take the script with Kevin around to various studios. My first stop is Warner Brothers, where I know the guy, Mark Canton, who's running Warner's. And right. Mark reads the script, or somebody there reads the script. And I have a meeting with Mark, and he says, Kevin Costner's not a movie star. We're not movie Never going to be a movie Never star. Never going to be a movie star. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, okay. So then. Well, you know, you, you, I don't know why anybody would ever say that. I would be always trying to hedge my bets on things like that. Yeah. But well, he said it. All right, My fine. dad, uh gave me very really good advice when I was a kid. He said, if you ever think you're in danger of dying, call a rabbi, a priest, a 
a Baptist minister and hedge your bet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and yeah. so... Um, so they, he doesn't want that because you want Kevin Kevin Costner, and and, yeah. he's, and they don't want Kevin Costner, so that's the end of that deal. And it's the end of the deal everywhere. Uh, we go to Fox. The budget is, I've done a budget, of course, on the picture, and it's going to be seven and a half, eight million dollars, maybe a little over eight, right in that mm -hmm. area to yeah. do everything we need to do. Which in those days is probably like a medium budget, maybe? Yeah, it's a, it's a low medium budget. Low medium, okay, right. fine. Remember that in... The early 70s, you could make a very respectable picture for a million dollars. Yeah. By that time, you could make a very respectable picture somewhere between seven and ten. Okay. So it was the equivalent of a million dollars a decade earlier. Right. Right. So Fox says, we'll give you two million bucks, and you'll be lucky to get it. And nobody wants to do this because of a baseball movie. To which I said, did you read the script? And, of course, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We turn it down. We go to Columbia, they turn it down. We go to Paramount, they turn it down. People say over and over again, baseball doesn't travel. No one's yeah. interested in baseball. Not gonna, I'm not going to look at this in Europe. But there's no international, yeah. there's no nothing. You'll never make a dime. Right. Nobody wants to do that. All that long stuff. Yeah. So I have an agent named Jeff Berg. Jeff Berg is Buzz, the chairman of ICM, which is one of the big three agencies, and a very, very smart character. Uh, a man of enormous um, personal integrity, but also relentless work ethic. So Jeff and I are friends. And he said, let me try Orion. So we did. We went to Orion. Orion was not a major studio. It had a distribution group. They could distribute a film. But it was what was called in those days a mini-major. There were a few of them. United Artists was one. Right. You know? Yeah. So they finally kind of said yes. When I say kind of said yes, they said basically we have two deals here. The good deal and the bad deal, we'll give you the bad deal. And the and bad deal was what? The bad deal was they'd give us $7.8 million and they'd let us make the picture, but they'd keep a lot of controls. Okay. They wanted to have approval of the cast. They mm. had to approve Kevin, but they already had No Way Out made. Right. And they'd seen pieces of it. Yeah. So they believed that the guy could act. So you could get, that's one hump you got over you, that they, they, they were okay with <coughs> Kevin. They had no idea who would play Nuke Lelouch, and they didn't care. Right. Because it was the third character. For the girl, they wanted somebody they didn't know who was star. Get yeah. us a star. Get us Sharon Stone. Right. Get us something like that. We don't yeah. know. But anyway. We were trying to put the movie together and observe the budget and get it all done so we can shoot in that calendar year. And it's, we're losing the summer. Yeah. And the movie's set in the middle of the summer. It's baseball, for God's sake. It needs to be warm and yellow and sexy and interesting. And it's getting closer and closer to Labor Day. Uh -huh. So we're trying to find a way to cast Annie Savoy, that role. There are some actresses. There's one in New York that the director likes. There are a couple of people. We look, we do readings. Can you remember any of these people? I wouldn't use their names right now because at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, might be embarrassing for them. Might be. I got gotcha. you. Let people off the hook. Yeah. They still have careers. Yeah, They're sure. still around. Yeah. The point is. Michelle Pfeiffer, I'm guessing. I wouldn't know. <laughs> so. I don't know. You're, you're just I'm, just, I'm just, you're just, just awful. picking it apart. That's Did all. Did you ever hear of the phrase "take the fifth? <laughs> okay, go you ahead. I'm fountain. just guessing. I you didn't say it's I take fountain. I say take. The <laughs> take the fifth. Yeah. So Martha Luttrell is an agent at ICM. She calls me up. She has a client named Susan Sarandon. Susan Sarandon is living in Italy. She has somehow read the script. I'm sure Martha sent it to her. Right. Because Jeff has the script. So yeah. that he has it. Everybody in the agency has it, and they know now that Orion's really willing to pay to make the movie. So right. Susan Sarandon calls me from Italy, and she says, I love this thing, and I want to do it, and I'm coming in to read for it. At this stage in her career, Susan Sarandon doesn't have to read. Right. But she makes that offer. She's a real star at this stage. She's Everybody knows who Susan Sarandon is. Yeah, at she's this a point. real star. Atlantic City's come out, yeah. all that stuff. She's yeah. a real star. Right. So on top of that, she pays for her plane ticket. Who does that? Nobody does that. Right. She does it because she wants to do the part. Right. So she shows up, and Bonnie Timmerman, our casting director, has found a completely idiosyncratic guy whose sole credit, as far as I can tell, is Howard the Duck. 
and mm. that guy is Just Tim Robbins. And suddenly, I he couldn't up, have been that well known then. He's unknown. He's been in Howard the Duck. That was it. That was it. That he was. He was some. I don't funny, know. Funny, funny. I don't remember him. Was he actually in that? Yeah, I think so. Wow. Okay. But just go ahead. Who knows? In any event, I look <laughs> out the window, and there's a tall, gangly guy. Yeah. On the grass lawn in front of the building. Pitching a baseball to somebody. And I think, who is that guy? He looks like, a, a he looks like some character out of Don Quixote. He looks like a completely spasmodic lunatic. Yeah. throwing a ball in the air, has no idea what he's doing. And I thought, well, Bonnie comes in and says, that is Nuke Lelouch. Mm -hmm. So Ron meets him and looks at him and loves him, yeah. as do I, by the way. The whole question was, can anybody teach him to pitch before we shoot? Right. So Ron and, and uh, Tim Robbins disappear to the batting cage for pitching practice every day right. from – then on. There's just no day that they're not pitching. Right. Because we have to get there. Yeah. So Susan Sarandon reads for Ron, Bonnie Timmerman, myself, Anna Ben Dove, maybe one or two other people in a room at on the Warner lot. She's genius. No, of course. It's not good. It's so good. Yeah. That you can't imagine anything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's that magic thing that happens yeah. when you're working with actors who really know what they're doing. Well, she you also know. knew she could do it. Well, and you know. she totally understood it. Yeah. She got it one up one side and down the other, yeah. and it was no, there was no question. So I go to our friends at Orion, mm -hmm. a man named Mike Metavoy, ex-agent. Yeah, he's right now right around. Right. He's a producer. Yeah, he's sure. still around somewhere. Mm -hmm. And and I say, uh, Susan Sarandon is going to play Annie Savoy. He said, it, no. We're not going to approve her. She's too old and she's not sexy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, worst of all, uh, how old is she at this stage? Oh, maybe. I don't know, but. Not, not very. Not very old. 35, maybe? Maybe, yeah. Uh, well, f first of all, so doesn't the part call for someone who's both kind of like, she has to, she almost has to be almost a mother to him. She has to have gravitas. She has to have gravitas, that's yes, one. That's right. And anybody who says Susan Sarandon <laughs> isn't sexy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. That, how does anybody say that with a straight face? Curious remark. <laughs> I thought. So I said this to Susan. I sat down and said, "Listen, I just got a phone with Metavoy, and mm. and he thinks you're not sexy and all this stuff. And I'm going to call him back, and I'm going to ask him for a courtesy meeting to give you 30 minutes mm -hmm. and tell him we can't just turn you down, and you go pick out the dress you think is appropriate and get over there." And spend 30 minutes leaning over Mike Metavoy's desk, and we mm -hmm. will have this done. Yeah. And she does. And Susan saves the day. That Later that same afternoon, Metavoy calls me out several hours after his meeting with Susan. And he said, you know, Tom, I've been thinking about this. I think people misunderstand Susan. <laughs> <laughs> people by him. He's yeah. the one who misunderstands yeah. her. So All right, fine. we now have a cast. <laughs> we have a cast. And many other wonderful people. Right. Trey Wilson and... and Robert Wool and all kinds of other wonderful yeah, actors Wall, joined the I cast. I love him. But now we're rolling, and we need to lock in our location. So Ron Shelton has been doing a quick tour of grade B and C minor league clubs in the South. Yeah. And he's been to Wilson and to I don't know where, all over the place. There's <laughs> places in Georgia and Alabama, places in Alabama that I, we still haven't heard of. Right. And he's lucky that he got back, and he – chose El Toro Field in Durham, and that's great. And since we already had well, the club, it made life easier. So he chooses a field that you already own. Well, we have a lease on it, yes. You have a lease on it. Yeah. But isn't, is it, where did the name Bull Durham come from? Wasn't it uh, already Bull Durham? No. Uh, the it was called something else? The movie was called many different things. It was called A Player to be Named Later. It was called <laughs> all kinds of stuff. And... And I grew up in Durham. Yeah. And if you grew up in Durham, you understand that there's a tradition in ballparks of something called the bullpen. Mm -hmm. The reason it's called the bullpen is that Bull Durham Tobacco bought the wall behind the bullpen in every ballpark in America and painted a giant red bull, which was the oh. logo of their tobacco product in the 1800s oh, wow. and 1900s. Durham started playing baseball in 1902 ballpark and so 
by the time we get to settling on a name, I start advocating for Bull Durham right. as the name. The tobacco brand has gone out of fashion. Right. I have I lease the rights. I call the people that own it, blah, 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 mm-hmm. and I make sure we ha- can use the, it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares, nobody's using it. Yeah. And the movie becomes Bull Durham. So we, <laughs> we set up in uh, North Carolina and we get ready to shoot. One of the things that uh, Ron wanted to do, and I think it was completely correct, is he wanted to have very snazzy uniforms for these guys. And that was all great. We wanted that we, the owners of the Durham Bulls, wanted new uniforms. So we had hired Marilyn Vance, a costume designer and the woman who did most of the uh, uh, clothing for Fiorucci in New York. We hired her to create a new uniform for the Durham Bulls. And that uniform was basically like her spandex Uh because Marilyn went to a ball game and she came away and said quite intelligently, there are all these girls here, and all they want to do is see these guys' butts. Right. What are you doing? You have them yeah. dressed in this stuff, this yeah. wool stuff, and yeah. you can't see anything. Let's make this sexy. Yeah. So she sent all these uniforms in which we were going to use in the movie, but they were stolen within 24 hours of being put in a locked warehouse in Durham. Really? So that disappeared. Yeah. So <laughs> then we're beginning to reckon with the fact that Weather has changed. You know, we didn't start shooting till November. Oh, okay. November in North Carolina, it's not summer. It's not quite winter yet. Yeah. So we have to spray paint the ball field, the infield. We paint green with water-soluble paint. We spray the whole thing. To make it look like grass. To make it look like grass. It's still right. alive. Uh-huh. We have a lot of extras, 300 extras in some scenes in the stands. We have to make them all chew ice so their breath isn't seen by the camera. While they're in the stand, is that is that work? Very well. You chew ice. You the, you, do, you don't see the lower uh, the temperature you in your mouth, and the hot air coming out is no longer hot enough to cause a vapor. Ah, what a nice trick. Yeah, okay. Many nice tricks. We had to employ a lot of nice tricks. We put up a sign. Our art director, who's great, Australian maniac, put up a sign. Giant cutout of a bull. Mm-hmm. Hit the bull. Win a steak dinner. So when you hit the bull, the eyes blink red on the bull, and steam comes out of the bull's nostrils. Ah. Very exciting. Yeah. Today, in the new ballpark in Durham, which was built after we sold the team and mm-hmm. after the movie came out, right. they have recreated the same sign that does the same thing. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So it carries on. Yeah. And the Durham Bulls are now a triple-A club. They were a, a single-A Carolina League club. Right. And so... We start shooting. Things are going pretty well, actually. Kevin, by the way, is great. Yeah, He's a total gentleman. He's on time and in charge and makes everything work. Susan is even better. We have some hiccups. Susan's hair looks awful. Mm-hmm. I look at the first couple of days' work. What's wrong with her hair? So I just said we have no more money. Ron gives up a little bit of his fee. I give up a little bit of my fee. We throw some more money in the kitty. We bring a hairstylist from Bumble and Bumble in New York, which is a kind of chic shop. Yeah, sure. But they know what they're doing. Right. And suddenly Susan looks like a million bucks. Mm-hmm. Then a week into this, Metavoy's looking at dailies in Los Angeles. And I get a call saying, um, you got to fire the director. Okay. Why would I be firing Ron <laughs> Shelton since everything I'm seeing looks great and the guy's yeah. doing a great job? Right. So, well, the movie's not funny. Well, we weren't shooting every funny scene first. You know, it's a process that takes sure. many weeks and yeah. you don't shoot all the gags in one group. And I, so I have that argument. It's also not wall to wall laughs anyway. Well, it's, it's not, not meant to be. be that sort it's of film. It's not supposed to be. Yeah. No, it's not a laugh riot movie. This isn't Animal House. No. This is a completely different kettle of fish. Ron believed, and I believe, that the movie had to have two things. It had to have utter baseball authenticity, right? which it had. I must say, I've been really pleased, and Ron has too, I know, with ball players who see the movie and say it's the best version of the minors we've ever seen on film. It's exactly what it was like. 
we stayed in that funky motel. We rode in that awful bus. Yeah. We had that experience in the locker room, had moss growing on the ceiling. We, you know. It also explores something that I, I always thought that, that you don't see a lot, which is what is the magic combination that creates confidence right. and um, excellence? Yes. What is that exactly? And, it's, and it is complicated, isn't it? It is complicated. And you've got a guy, Kevin, who the Crash Davis character, who's trying to find a way to cling to baseball and also looking at the horrible idea of finishing up his career. Yeah. And you have Tim Robbins, Luke Lelouch, who suddenly sees that he might be able to go to the bigs. Yeah. He has a million dollar arm yeah. and a five cent brain, as right. they say in the movie, and that's about right. Yeah. And so there's a lot going on and, and Susan is sleeping with both guys trying mm -hmm. to make up her mind. Yeah. Like a lot of people do. So, and I've had a lot of uh, feedback, negative feedback from the studio about that because they would say things like, I would, it's horrible she's sleeping with both guys. Well, and, uh, you know, so Bill, I just want to suggest <laughs> out there that among men and women who are of dating age mm -hmm. and in that bubble, mm -hmm. sometimes you sleep with more than one person. Sometimes you sleep with more than one person at the same time. Also, sh it's a movie, and she's a muse. Yes. She's a muse. That's the whole Church, Church of Baseball. That's exactly right. And so, so it's, and that, it, everything it entails, and some of it's sexual, and some of it is not. That's all true. And she's trying to figure out whether she should stay with the Tim Robbins character, who she's kind of nurturing along and, right. and turning into a man yeah. and a player. She's teaching him how to play. Yeah. Or she's really intrigued by Crash Davis. Right. Who's tired and worn out and maybe at the end of his rope, but who has something. He has depth. And that's something new in her life. Right. So it's that core of romance that I think makes the movie what it is. Also, I think that that's the thing that makes it. If, if you don't like baseball and you don't like sports, it doesn't matter with this movie. You get this, everybody has to, do, you know, everybody deals with this. Yes. Everybody is, you're, you're going to be at the beginning of, of uh, realizing your potential or at the end of it at some point. And that's, that's the crux of the film. So I can't fire Ron Shelton because it would be ridiculous. First of all, the guy wrote the script. Secondly, he's a friend of mine. Thirdly, he's doing a great job. So what the fuck does Orion know? I've right. had it. Yeah. Tell, tell these guys to fuck themselves. So I tell my lawyers to call Orion. Yeah. and say, we'll take the picture back. We'll give you back your money. By the way, I have no money to give them back. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You just, that's what you say, though. That's what you say. We have to take a very, <laughs> as they say in You've already paid for a hairdresser we, to come we, down from New York. We want to announce <laughs> our presence with authority. Right. And so um, the Orion guys go, well, you've got to do something to change the look of the movie. So we had an, a very nice man, a very competent director of photography, the DP. Mm -hmm. But... The film doesn't look sexy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look romantic. So I have a DP I've worked with many times, a guy named Bobby Byrne, now mm -hmm. deceased. But Bobby was a great DP. He shot 16 Candles for me. He shot Stealing Home for me, a Jodie sure, Foster yeah, film. Yeah. He shot Smokey and the Bandit, the first one for me, and made Sally Field look gorgeous. She and did. And she did. And he's really good with women. Mm -hmm. So I get Bobby Byrne. I replace the DP. I go back to the studio and lie to them and mm -hmm. say, this has broken the director's heart. I had to fire the DP. Wait, you lied, you lied about the Every week until we got the picture finished. You, you, you told them you fired the director, you didn't no. tell them you fired the director? No, I didn't tell them I fired the director. I told them I fired the DP okay. and broke the director's heart. Right. But the new DP, and as if we punished the director somehow, right, which exactly. we didn't do at all. Right. And Ron totally got it. He looked at the dailies. He saw what Bobby Byrne was doing. I said to Bobby, just make her look stunning and make yeah. this romantic, yeah. and he did. And now we're rolling, and we're beginning to get a movie that looks like something. By the way, shooting in Durham is a very weird experience for me. Yeah. I went to high school in Durham. Right. Or, uh, by the way, I dropped out two months before graduation. Nevertheless. You dropped out of high school? Well, yeah. I was bored. But you went to college. You must have gotten something. 
Well, you I got, got some sort of degree. Yeah, well, you did one of those GED things. Oh, I see. Okay. Which allowed me to get into some series of colleges who were foolish enough to let me in. And Bard, blah, blah, blah. for example. For example. Yeah. Like Cal Arch for graduate there you school go. and stuff yeah, like that. Sure. So in any event. All right. So you just don't want people to think you're uneducated. Oh, you're I am. Educated. I trust <laughs> no, no, no. Trust me, by my standards, I am wildly uneducated. <laughs> yeah. So I look at the stands one day. We're shooting. And I realize half the people in the stands I recognize from high school. Like, oh, my God. I went oh to high school with these man. people. And the mayor is there, Wib Gully. Only in Durham can you have a mayor named Wib Gully. But Wib Gully uh, sounds like the mayor of Durham. Yeah, he is the mayor. Yeah. He's the abs- and he was a great mayor, and he was very helpful right. and terrific. And we made sure he was in the movie and all that stuff. Now, we also put some other people in the movie. Um, there was a friend of mine, a publicist in New York, uh, named Bobby Zerum. Yeah, Bobby, Z- you mm, may Bobby Zerum, Bobby. sure, yeah. knew Bobby Zerum. He was a big-time publicist in yeah. New York, but he was from Savannah, Georgia, and he was a baseball fanatic. Ah. And so we, without giving him a credit, we he played the third base coach ah. in Bull Durham, as an example. I didn't know and that. And Ron reached out to ball players of all kinds, mm-hmm. older black ball players who'd been in the Negro National League. Sure. Who would play for other teams? And remember, we had other teams we had to cast too. So we'd right. be playing in Asheville against the tourists, or we'd be playing right. in Wilson, or we'd be playing in some godforsaken part of the world. In any event, we had a lot of ball players. Yeah. And finally, we finished shooting this thing, and we take it to um, not Universal, but the old Goldwyn Studios on on Santa Monica Boulevard. And that were originally the United Artist Studios, and Sam Goldwyn took it over, and then Warner Brothers eventually bought it. In any event, we're doing post. Got an editing room, sound mixing, color correction, all the stuff you do. We're beginning to get the music together, and that was fun and, and really helpful. And <sighs> Orion is, uh, shall we say, diffident about the movie. They don't know whether what it is, and <laughs> and when we didn't fire the director, and they kind they of... They don't know what to make of it. They don't know what to make of it, and they kind of gave up on us. That right. was their feeling, in any event. Yeah. That and happens in, in your biz, oh right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, Where they're like, yeah, we're making this movie, but it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, no, it's nothing. Well, I just We've written it, it off. If anybody's ever listening to this podcast, which may not be true, but in case they are, yeah. I remind everyone that the then second in command to Lou Wasserman at Universal Sydney, J. Scheinberg, mm-hmm. said to me once when I was starting to move forward on E.T. that we shouldn't make this movie because it was only for children. Yeah, okay. So their opinions. Everybody's entitled everybody, to one. Everybody gets an opinion. Everybody gets an opinion. Uh, the, uh, you'd, you'd think people who make movies would have better opinions, though. You'd but think I, so. All right. But no. Okay. Not in my experience. Okay. Uh, so we now have a version of the movie, the right. director's cut. Ron Shelton's cut of the movie. And normally what you do at that stage is you begin to show it to people. You show it to some executives, but more likely, more importantly, you show it to a recruited audience right. in a research preview. Right. So we went to, we journeyed, Jeff Berg and I drove down together. We journeyed in to Lakewood, California, which is a Southern California hamlet between here and Orange County. Mm-hmm. And, and we previewed the movie. The Orion executives showed up, Medavoy and his team. Charlie Powell, who was their head of marketing, showed up. A few others. We ran the movie. Now, remember at this point, I've just finished running a studio for nine years. Right. And I've, in my 13 years at Universal, I've seen 220 or 30 previews. Right. So I've been through this experience. Sure. It's not the best research screening I ever had, but by no means the worst. Right. The good news is, all you learn at research screenings, by the way, is what's wrong. Right. What's right doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. What's right's easy. Yeah. But what's wrong is important. So we learned a few things, and Ron and I talk in the lobby, and we're saying, you know, okay, so we need to work on this, we need to work on that. Maybe there's about five minutes that needs to come out of this thing, and blah, blah, blah. And we're making our plan. And the Orion guys come out, and the head hunch of Orion says, basically, it's awful. It's not funny. It's never going to work. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to release it. Oh we'll man. let you know. 
blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> Berg and I drive home. Berg says, no, they're cowards, and they don't have any money. They're out of money at Orion, and yeah. they're, they're going to release it because they have to, and don't worry about this. So, Well, the problem is, of course, at that stage, you think they're not going to put anything behind it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So then uh, Ron and I do what the producer and the director always do. We refine the cut of the movie. We're working on the sound mix. We're finishing the music. We're doing all the stuff that's necessary to get a finished print. And they're gradually coming around to a release date for the movie, maybe. <laughs> and and um, we have no advertising campaign. When we talk to their ad guy who was assigned to the movie, the person at Orion, that guy, low-level ad guy, because this was not a priority movie for them. Remember, by the way, that Orion did make some good movies. Oh, yeah. They made Silence of the Lambs. Sure. They made Dances with Wolves. Yeah, they yeah, made yeah. some interesting, smart films. Right. There's a man named Charles Powell. Charlie Powell was the head of marketing for Orion. Charlie Powell I'd known from other jobs in the industry, and Charlie Powell was smart as hell. And he ran this movie. He saw it at the preview, and he was the one guy in the lobby who said to me, it's a good movie, don't worry. Mm -hmm. So we had it finished. We looked at it. It was working. Yeah. We could now run it for an audience, and they responded really well to it. So we knew right. there was something cooking here. Powell had to find a hook to advertise the movie. Everything we'd talked about had to do with baseball. Yeah. Charlie Powell said it's not a baseball movie. Yeah, no, I, th I agree with it's that. It's a romance. Yeah. And we're going to sell it like a romance. Yeah. And Kevin Costner's sexy as hell in this movie, and we're going to sell that. And so he came up with a photograph, a big close-up of Kevin's face, looking gorgeous, and a tagline that said, Bull Durham, a film about America's two favorite pastimes. And the second one is baseball. Yeah, it's a great line. It's a great line. New York Times wouldn't run it. Too salacious, too sexually suggestive for the New York Times. Wow. I know, that's what I said. What? After we got shot down with that su too suggestive tagline, mm -hmm. Charlie goes back through the movie, and Charlie Powell pulls out the following. There's a big, sexy picture of Kevin, oh. and it says, Meet Crash Davis. He believes in the small of a woman's back, the hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, chocolate chip cookies, and long, slow, deep, wet kisses that last for three days. There you go. That is Ron Shelton writing at his best. Yeah, that's great. That's that I remember a, that in the movie. That's a great <laughs> scene. And that yeah. was our ad. Yeah. That was the ad that went most of the way all around. By Wh the way, I just looked it up this morning. To buy an original one-sheet poster of Bull Durham, which are for sale from collector groups, right. now costs $250. This is insane. I should empty out my closet. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie goes out, and, and it, it, it does real business. It does real business. It like what kind? So you've, you've spent uh, seven or eight million dollars yeah. on this picture, and um, and it goes out, and it, and and how how much money does it make? Well. In its first release, theatrically in the U.S., it does fifty-eight million. Oh man! So, it was on big a, money back on then. A, on an, it was big money on an eight million dollar investment. Yeah, that's so right. So here's the way to look at that: you take the negative cost, multiply it times three, right, and you get to break even for rentals. And this is very general, but this works most of the mm -hmm. time. So let's just say that it's an eight million dollar movie, and mm -hmm. so at twenty-four you would be in profits. It, it, there used to be an old thing. It was like the eight million, if your movie was $8 million, your, your um, advertising budget needed to be $8 million or right. something. Yeah. And then the, is that any no. of that real? No. no. None, of that, none of that was real then, and it's not real it's now. It's not real now, okay. So what's real now, by the way, is an uh, advertising budget for a normal film. Normal films, at the minimum, cost 60 or $70 million right. and go up to about 250 so the advertising budgets for those films is generally more than the negative cost. Wow. That's if you amazing. Have, if you make a film for $100 million bucks today, you'll spend 120 or 30 on marketing. So if you make a so film for $100 million bucks today, you better be bringing in $300 million or something. Why do you think Marvel and Star Wars own theatrical? Right. Yeah. Because they can do that. Because they can do that and because... 
distributors are scared to death and looking for sure bets as mm -hmm. if there are any. Right. So let me just go on and talk a little bit about a couple of other things around this. Sure. In, uh, you know, there are lists that are published every year, lists of the best uh, sports movies ever made or the best sure. romantic movies ever made, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Bull Durham is always in the top three on all those lists. Sure. It has been for years and still yeah. is. Yeah. Ron Shelton gets nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. 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 As he should. Because it's a yeah. great script. Yeah. It's not a good script. It's a great script. Yeah. And then the Writers Guild gives him their annual award for Best Original Screenplay. Oh, that's great. Ron wins from his yeah. peers. Very yeah. important inside our little world. And then, of course, Ron goes on to write and direct all sorts of movies, many of them with a sports theme. Yeah. White Men Can't Jump. Right? Tin Cup. One of my favorites. Cobb. Cobb, yeah. Play It to Robert the Bone, Wolf. the yeah. boxing movie. Right. He also does Hollywood Homicide and Blaze and some other good movies. Right. Blaze, that's right. Yeah, I think he also wrote, did he write Blue Chip? Yes, I think so. And that's he wrote, I think, Bad Boys 2. Oh, yeah, okay. And some other stuff. Anyway, Ron's terrific. Big and career. And, and still going and still writing and directing and, and doing all stuff. So the movie not only... Does fifty-eight million in box office, so substantial profits for the company. It becomes a home video tornado. Right. Home video at that time in history, late eighties, home video is a big deal. Yeah, you starting know, to be a big thing. There's something out there right called there. Blockbuster, which everybody's right. going to every yeah. week, and you know. Sure. And so Bull Durham becomes one of the biggest home video titles, which adds many, many more tens of millions of dollars to the total net of the picture. And it begins to perform well in other places. It gets released in Japan, where it does very well. It well, gets Japanese do like American baseball. Well, they, 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 it's their baseball they now. They like baseball. They like baseball. Yeah, no, I... I yeah. So, uh, yes, I the have... Hiroshima Carp. And, you know, I <laughs> made friends with Sadahara O, oh, the yeah, famous yeah, pitcher. Exactly and, right, you yeah, exactly right. Sure, some yeah. So, in any event, it also works, as you can imagine, in Mexico and in Central American countries where baseball is known. Sure. And weirdly enough, it does well in France. Yeah, that, that makes no sense. Makes no sense. But they do like their romance. They do like romance. And she is sleeping with two guys, so and that well, says France. That's closer to yeah, France. That says France yeah, to so me. So, yeah. then... Uh, other things have spun out of this movie. Of course, Susan and Tim start a long-term relationship, right, which right. is well-documented and goes on for many years. Sure. And uh, that g has generated from the making of that movie. And I will say this. The thing I like best about this, Bill, is that for me, to get a chance to come to the town I grew up in, you know, like you going back to Oklahoma City, yeah, and make a film in my hometown in the ballpark, I frequented with my dad yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. Through staging a premiere in the Carolina Theater, which is the old big auditorium theater in downtown Durham where I saw my first movie. Mm -hmm. By the way, we had a 40 foot inflatable bull that I put out in something. Yeah. And so that combined with the notion that we really put Durham on the map. Yeah. But we did something else. We put minor league ball back on the map. Right. Minor league ball was never the same after that. We sold the Durham Bulls after nine years. After nine years of running the company and all these other teams, we sold the whole group, not as uh, uh, one at a time, various places. You know, uh, we achieved a lot of insane things in the baseball business. I was really happy that the Utica Blue Sox beat the Oneonta Yankees when George Steinbrenner was in the stadium for the game <laughs> during the baseball strike, yeah. and George didn't take that well, uh -huh. you know, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Uh, Billy Murray was unbelievably happy and helpful to us. He right. would show up, and he would play, and he would be in games, and he would announce games and do all sorts of That's stuff. That's great. And people were really supportive. We sold the Durham Bulls, which we paid $35,000 for, for just under $5 million. Nine years later, you know, I think I think also uh, there was there was always some a certain charm to going see, seeing a guy uh, pitch or bat or play play a uh, ball, and you knew he wasn't making twenty seven million dollars that That's year. That's right. 
you know, he was just somebody f scrapping his way through, just okay. trying to trying to get there somehow. And that, I will say, that has its own charm to it, doesn't it? Its it own appeal. Completely has its own charm. And you know, I took a friend of mine to see a Durham Bulls game, and uh, and he'd never been to a game before, and we had uh, bought a kind of a bull costume for someone to wear, a kind of character to jump around the field and all that right. stuff. And he looked at me and he said, "What? What is that big dog doing?" I said, well, it's not a dog. That's the bull. <laughs> that's the point. That's the bull thing. And I got to say, I love that. We did cash drops from helicopters in the seventh inning stretch. We had people married on the pitcher's mound in the seventh inning stretch. Oh, that's we had people spread their ashes yeah. who wanted to in the seventh inning stretch on yeah. the pitcher's mound. That's, that's just yeah. weird, by the way, but yeah, okay. That's right. We did <laughs> dollar hot dog days. Okay, we did, that I like. Yeah, we did. <laughs> They've gone from ten cents to a buck by the time you've done that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. By the time you know, uh, this is uh, this has been a this is a great story. By the way, this is we're going to do two parts on this because we're going to have yes. Ron Shelton, who's going to be with us. Uh, I want to be sure that I talk just a little bit about Ron Shelton's upcoming book. Yes, Ron has written a wonderful book about this subject, which will be out in a few months from now. And uh, we look very forward to talking to Ron about that. That'll be great. Again, we remind you there are no shortcuts on this route to uh, the world of show business, but there are many, many detours, and we have seen them today. This is Bill Getty with Tom Mount advising you to take Fountain.